Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Math 275, um, Ergodic Theory, Geometry, and Dynamics. Um, let's see, I want to just talk a little bit about the logistics of the course to start out with, and, um, and then uh, jump into some survey of, uh, of topics that are related to the course, maybe state some of the significant theorems that you might not think are related to ergodic theory that we will discuss in this course, give you an idea of the lay of the land and the other parts of mathematics it connects to. And, um, and then launch into some examples of uh, dynamical systems. Uh, so um, let me just ask, uh, are there any questions before we get started? Oh, sorry, I had a question. Yes. Um, it indicated on the course site that uh, iPads were necessary. Yes. So I was just wondering what pass or what kind of functionality uh, you know, we need on our tablets. I have a tablet that's not an iPad. That's why. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. It doesn't have to be an iPad. <laughs> okay. It's the the. So the main reason it says you need an iPad is at least twofold. One is that if we say you, we need an iPad for the course that it's required, then everyone at Harvard can get an iPad from Hewitt uh, as a loan. And if we don't say that, then you can't. So <laughs> that's the main reason for saying that. But the, I think the main purpose of the iPad is to help students uh, um, talk with each other uh, offline or in small groups when we go to breakout rooms, uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, I, I, there may be some use in class, but I don't have a plan for that at the moment. And certainly another kind of tablet is fine. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So let me just say, um, before I launch into like logistics, just a few words about um, about uh, teaching this uh, class on Zoom. So I'm going to try a lot of experiments this semester, since this is a semester like no other. And some may work and some may fail. And I really appreciate getting feedback on that. Uh, you can send me an email. You can send, um, you can post something to the Slack channel. Um, to let me know what's working and what isn't. So I just wanted to give you a heads up in advance that um, I'm going to try some experiments. And I think one of the one of the hard things with with Zoom is uh, getting uh, you know a sense of the community of the class and so on. So um, let me let me uh, uh, announce some ground rules in advance or just some ideas for how the class should proceed. So. Uh, I don't actually mind if you have a burning question or I've made a terrible mistake if you just unmute and tell me so. Um, another way to, um, to interact in the course is to raise your hand. So I assume everybody knows how to raise your hand in the participant window. And another way is to type something in chat. Thank you, V. <laughs> uh, another way is to type something in the chat and sometimes uh, having a dialogue between students in class over the chat is a useful adjunct to the lecture itself. Also, uh, let me start by introducing um, Carl Windsor, our teaching assistant, 
So let me just see if I can do this. I'll pin your video. Carl, do you want to say hi? Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Carl. I'm a fourth year uh, grad student. Um, I'll yeah, be the course assistant for this course, and I'll be holding a Friday uh, discussion section and a uh, Monday office hours um, to go over background or other topics people not, might not feel comfortable with and to get uh, homework help. Great. Thanks. So um, uh, let me um, also say that I, I may sometimes, um, I like to teach in sort of a Socratic mode where I don't have to know anything or prove anything. I just get answers from the class. And so I would like to have a dialogue as much as possible. Um, I, I will sometimes, if there's complete silence, um, call on people. I might even uh, call on you by name. Uh, if I do, don't, don't, don't be disconcerted. Say whatever you have on your mind. And you're also free to say pass. So that's, those are, that's my idea of the ground rules for how to run a Zoom session. Um, so I, I'm not sure if there's anything else, uh, but, but um, let, me, let me ask one request I have is that if you are um, attending the class, then as much as possible, you, um, you uh, share your video with us. I mean, obviously, if there's some particular reason you're uncomfortable or you're absent, uh, that's fine. But um, the default should be that you, you're, you're, you're present uh, in the sense that we can all um, see each other's faces. Um, I should also mention that there are a lot of people who signed up or wrote to me about auditing the course or being guests in the course. So there will be um, uh, some people um, attending the Zoom session now and then who are not formally enrolled, but I will um, uh, restrict any breakout sessions to just the people who are formally enrolled uh, in the class. Okay, so um, any questions at this moment? So I'm going to just um, I'm going to just go over the um, course uh, a little bit, um, sharing this the um, web page for it, which I'm sure you've all looked at, although you might not have seen its most recent graphic because that was just added 45 minutes ago. So um, let's see. One thing I want to mention right off is. It is possible that the whole Zoom system might go down someday or that my audio and whatever might collapse. Um, if there is a technical failure, I'll send an email to the whole course about how it will proceed. If we're going to reconnect in half an hour, if we're going to have a makeup class, whatever. Um, so that, that's just to know there is, that's how I plan to proceed if there is some kind of technical failure, which I hope won't happen. So let's take a quick look at the syllabus. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the topics in the course today. I should emphasize that the, the list of topics here says may include, and um, I'm going to kind of adapt the course to um, the, my sense of the audience. I know people have very different levels of preparation. And I should say that if I do do something, um, that relies on some topic from hyperbolic geometry or say, measure theory that you don't know about, please uh, come to Carl's section or to his office hours or to my office hours, and I'll be happy to provide background. There's also lots of background in the texts that are uh, listed here on the webpage. So the, the main um, notes for this course are, uh, are these here, and I want to emphasize that I'm changing these practically every day. So don't print them out now and think that's the notes for the course. Actually, they're not even really the notes for the course. The course will only vaguely follow this, uh, this set of notes, which has accumulated over many uh, attempts at teaching a similar course in the past. Uh, and there will be stuff added to it. I should say that all the problems I'm gonna describe are, are, are in the notes. Um, and then there's a lot of suggestions for more references and you'll be able to get an idea as we go along which ones are relevant to what we're talking about at a given time. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, you, you should have an iPad or a similar device uh, to um, 
facilitate online collaboration. And you can get one if you're a Harvard student by emailing the um, address that's somewhere, um, either on the Canvas page or the course page. Um, so I listed a lot of prerequisites. This is really supposed to be a graduate topics course. That doesn't mean other people can't uh, attend. Um, but I am thinking of, I'm, I'm going to speak the language of measure theory, functional analysis, Lie groups, hyperbolic geometry, et cetera. Um, so I am ex expecting or hoping that people will read the course notes before class. That'll do a couple of things. It'll mean you won't have to take notes during class probably. And, um, but also I should say that the lectures uh, may go beyond the reading. Um, and not, I'm not going to cover everything that's in the course notes. The, my intention, since people are, some people are in different time zones, is to at least uh, initially um, uh, record all the classes. So this class is being recorded. Um, okay, so a big part of this course is the homework problems. Now maybe you're, you're uh, a, a graduate student who's passed their quals and you don't need a grade in this course and you don't need to do homework. I still encourage you to look at the problems. In fact, you would probably learn more if you just skipped this course completely, took the course notes and tried to do all of the problems that are at the end of them. Um, after all, mathematics is an active experience. So, so I really encourage people to, to work on the course, uh, work on the uh, homework problems, which I'll try to assign so that they're relevant to the course. The problems will be constantly changing. Sometimes that results in me getting the numbers shifted. I apologize in advance for that. Um, and please, please feel free, even if you're not taking the course for a grade, to write up homework problems and hand them in to Carl, uh, virtually, of course, um, and, uh, and, and get some feedback on them. Uh, I do want to say that this course has a uh, Slack channel. Let me see if I can go there. Um, So this is, this is reached via the, um, this can be reached directly via the web page or the Canvas page. And um, I did ask everybody to say a word about themselves on the Slack channel. I know some people haven't gotten around to it, but um, I, a lot of people have told me it's really helpful. Just because we can't keep meeting in person, it's hard to have casual conversations after class, etc. By the way, I am going to try to leave the Zoom session on at the end of class so people have a chance to talk informally to me or, or uh, to each other. Um, so really, please, everyone who's, who's enrolled in the class, please just post one line uh, to the Slack channel to introduce yourself. Doesn't matter. You don't have to list everything you like in life. You could just say, I'm taking ergodic theory because I don't know what it is and I want to know, or something of that ilk. Anything is fine. Um, okay, so let me go back to, um, to, let's see here, is this my page? Uh, right. Um, okay, so as, I, as I've written here, I do expect people to attend the lectures regularly if they're enrolled and to work on the homework assignments. Of course, this is more informal if you're a post quals grad student, but I'd still appreciate it if people attend and share their video when they're in the Zoom lectures. Um, and, and anyone who needs a grade in the course will get one based on the homework and perhaps one or two additional assignments, probably just the homework. Um, so let me, let me take a little poll now and uh, see, let me stop sharing. So, could you please click yes or no um, in answer to the question, do you need a letter grade in this course? It's so helpful that Zoom will count up the answers for me. Uh, Where is the poll? Okay, so it's not actually a poll. I shouldn't have used that word. If you click on participants, 
then it will bring up a list of the names of everybody um, in this Zoom call. And then you can, there's yes and no buttons at the bottom of it. Did that work for you? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think I saw a hand raise. Michael? Yeah, I guess I raised my hand because I'm still taking calls, so I guess I don't know the answer yet. Okay. <laughs> I'll take that as, a, as just a question mark for now. Uh, that's fine. Um, okay, great. So, so we have about eight people who will, um, who will be definitely getting a grade. And as I say, I really encourage other people to participate uh, actively in the course. Um, okay, so let me go back to this um, uh, share. And um, let's see, what else do I want to show you? So we talked about the Slack channel. The office hours are here um, on the web page. Uh, mine are on Wednesday. Carl has meetings on Monday and Friday. So every day of the week, you can either go to the course, go to a section, or go to an office hours. Everything will be on the same link. So you just use the same link you used to come to this um, page today. Everything will be by Zoom. Hours are there. Our emails are there. Are there. Uh, don't hesitate to contact uh, either of us. And I will be posting the, the uh, suggested readings and homework uh, here. And again, <laughs> make sure you use the current version of the course notes. If you are doing homework for the course, it will be due at the start of class on Tuesdays. And I'll probably post it Thursday evening or Friday morning. Uh, so you'll have, have the weekend, Monday, etc., cetera, to, uh, to work on them. Uh, I strongly encourage everyone who is doing homework to collaborate. Collaboration is not just allowed, but it's really expected. Um, and uh, if you, when you do collaborate with others, you should still write up your results yourself, and, um, and then you should cite your collaborators. It's good practice for preparing to write papers. Um, so there's none to, to today, um, but uh, next Thursday, um, I will be signing homework to be due, I guess, on the 15th of um, September. Um, and of course, unfortunately, you have to submit your homework by email rather than putting it on a big pile on the desk, which I always enjoy at the beginning of class. Um, okay, so any questions on the logistics of the course? Okay, so again, I really encourage people to say, to just drop a, a word about themselves in the Slack channel. And um, I guess I'm going to now start talking about the course proper from a mathematical point of view. Um, okay, so this is our, our first big experiment, which is I'm going to try something that's a little unusual, which is I'm going to try to give a lecture from the Blackboard. So hopefully, you're now seeing a picture of a blackboard. And there's possibilities of technical failures here. So let me know if it gets out of focus. There's a problem with the sound, anything like that. Um, OK, so this is a course on ergodic theory. Uh, geometry and uh, dynamics. So let me first by saying a word about um, about what these topics really are. So ergodic theory uh, starts with some kind of a measure space, usually um, with a probability measure. So there's, there's no topology. The space is very uh, flexible. Uh, in fact, you can usually assume the space is isomorphic to the unit interval. And then we have a transformation T from X to X, some kind of measurable mapping. And usually we 
and presume that T preserves the metric. So I like to think of ergodic theory as sort of the advanced theory of permutations. If, if X were a finite set with counting measure, T would just be a, a permutation. X is, however, this diffuse measure space, and uh, we want to understand how it can scramble measurable sets around. So it's a, you know, you might be starting with a manifold or a leak group or some more exotic space here, but we're going to just forget about all of that structure and just record its, its, its uh, behavior as a measure space. That's the topic of, of uh, ergodic theory. Now, what is geometry? Geometry, unlike measure theory, is much more concrete. Um, for us, this will generally mean, well, you know, classically geometry is about shapes. Distance is the most important um, uh, concept, together with angle, I guess. And um, more generally, we might abstract this and talk about Riemannian manifolds. That's some kind of geometry. But also, you might have sort of discrete kinds of geometry, like a graph. As long as you can measure distance between points, even in a metric space, you're doing some kind of geometry. Now, what is dynamics? Dynamics is a lot like uh, ergodic theory, except now X is a topological space. And uh, T from X to X is, say, a homeomorphism. Or it might just be a continuous map. And we'll see examples. Uh, it, for most of this, our discussion, you can imagine that T is a bijection here and here. Uh, but sometimes we'll want to allow T to be a sort of endomorphism of our space. Um, now, um, I want to give you some ideas of how this theory connects with broader mathematics. Um, so I'm going to discuss some other ideas and results that um, perhaps surprisingly flow from or are connected to this circle of ideas. But let me say right off the bat that this circle of ideas connects to all sorts of stuff, combinatorics, algebraic geometry, number theory, automorphic forms. I'm just free associating here. Uh, Low-dimensional topology, geometry, So I hope everyone uh, is interested in at least one of these topics or these topics. It's a pretty broad range of mathematical topics that are involved in this discourse. Okay, so some, some sample results that flow from ergodic theory, but maybe don't sit inside of ergodic theory proper. So let me first discuss the notion of an expanding graph. And um, let me start by uh, just giving you two examples. Um, so I'll let TD be the tree of degree D. So that just means it's an infinite graph where every vertex has D edges coming out of it and it's connected. So T2, is just an infinite uh, line, and T3 is, is a tree that you can imagine it as having a root, and then it spreads out in sort of a bifurcating pattern. It grows uh, in a bifurcating way from its root, and of course T4 is like T3, it just grows more rapidly. Now, 
we say that an infinite graph like this is an expander. Um, if there exists a constant lambda greater than zero, such that for all finite sets of vertices, A, the size of the boundary of A is greater than or equal to lambda uh, times the size of A itself. So for example, let's look at T2. Is T2 an expander? Somebody, oh, I see a hand raised, yes? Is that a leftover hand? Hello? Yeah, I think it might be left over from the- Okay. <laughs> uh, does somebody unmute and tell me whether- Is the boundary, boundary of A, uh, you mean the vertices? Uh, oh, yeah. Good. Not, uh, not the okay, so the first thing you should say is, excuse me, what is the question? So, good point. So in this combinatorial setting, what do we mean by the boundary? So if you have a bunch of vertices, they don't have to be connected, but say they are. If this is A, then by the boundary of A, I mean the vertices that are attached to A by an edge, but which are not part of A itself. So this part here in white is the boundary of A. Okay. So is T2 an expander? No. Okay. Why not? Because the A is size two. Or, well, it could be, well, it could have like different, uh, just, just uh, like, for example, a really long segment, you just take consecutive points. And then what happens? And then like the A is size two. Well, like the size of A could be really large. And what's the boundary? But the boundary is the two endpoints. Yeah, right. Okay, so this is, this is not an expander. Um, because you can take this to be A, an arbitrarily long segment, and the size of the boundary of A, which are equal to two points. The size of A can be any large integer n. Now, it's not quite obvious, but I think it kind of seems right that this tree is an expander. Um, that, that is, in fact, it has the property that the size of the boundary of A is greater than or equal to the size of A. Um, and a similar result holds for the trees of all higher degree. Uh, so it's easy to give examples of infinite graphs that are expanders. However, it's a challenge to give examples of finite graphs that are expanders. Now for a finite graph, you have to modify the definition a little bit. So if the graph is finite, you want to add the condition that the size of A is less than or equal to say, the number of vertices in the graph divided by two. Obviously, if you take all the vertices in the graph, it doesn't have any boundary. and You can't have this expansion. But suppose you take less than half the vertices. Um, and then the issue of constructing an expanding finite graph is, well, not just to construct one, because if you have a single graph, of course there's some lambda, such that this holds, at least if the graph is connected. But, um, but rather, to construct larger and larger finite graphs, which are uniformly expanded. In other words, what we want to do is construct large graphs which behave like trees, but are nevertheless finite. And in fact, if you think about this, yes, question? Is there a question, comment? Okay, so if you think about this condition, if you start with one point, then the size of its boundary will it be, be at least as big as lambda. And then the size of the boundary 
of a union its boundary will it be, be at least a size lambda more. So you'll find that if you take a single point and you form the balls of larger and larger size around it, they'll grow exponentially fast at a rate that's dictated by this constant lambda until they get to be about the size of the graph itself. And then of course, they can't continue to grow exponentially fast. So what we're looking for are finite graphs that behave like trees until you get about to the size of the graph itself, and then suddenly it becomes finite. And in fact, the, 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 the statement that there exists a sequence of expanding graphs was an open problem for a long time. And uh, it's a theorem of Margulis that um, there exist GK expanders which are finite and uh, with a uniform lambda, uniform lambda, and the number of vertices in GK goes to infinity. Okay, so this is a this is a result that can almost be regarded as a combinatorial result. And by the way, when Margulis proved this result, he was working for a um, telecommunication institute in the Soviet Union. And the reason people in electrical engineering and telecommunication are interested in this idea is you might have, say, a computer network or a, a communication network with a lot of nodes, and then some of the nodes suddenly fail. Not, not, more, not half of them, but some, some of them fail. And uh, if you're lucky, you can reroute traffic to the nearby nodes. As long as there's enough nearby nodes, which is why you need this thing to be as big as this. So a, a layout like this is very bad because you, you might have this vast failure of consecutive uh, sites, and then there's only two nodes they can re reroute the traffic to. So you get a huge amount of traffic trying to flow through these two nodes. But in a tree, you'll always uh, be able to find about as many nodes as, as failed. And so you'll have to increase the traffic here, but only by a factor of about one over lambda. And similarly here, um, uh, we, we, we have finite network configurations that, were, that have this good replacement property um, uniformly as the size of the network grows. Okay, so that, this is one of the results we're going to develop in this course that doesn't appear to be directly related to uh, ergodic theory. Um, now let me do a, a result in topology. And let me, let me save this result over here. Let's keep a little list of the results that we're talking about. So expanders. Um, So in topology or geometry, these two fields are very closely linked in dimensions two and three. Um, we have the notion of a, a hyperbolic n-manifold. So n is uh, hyperbolic. Um, let's say for the moment that m is a compact manifold. And then we say it's hyperbolic if Mn is isomorphic to the quotient of hyperbolic n space by the action of a group of isometries. So this is equivalent to saying it admits a metric of constant negative curvature. Now, one thing you might wonder is once you found a metric of constant negative curvature on this initially topological manifold, is it unique? And this is the theorem of Margulis, of uh, Mostar rather, which says that if H from M1 to M2 is, and now I'm just going to say 
a homotopy equivalence between compact hyperbolic manifolds, then M1 is in fact isometric to M2. And this has some fantastic consequences. For example, hyperbolic manifolds have some sort of volume. So the volume of M is a homotopy invariant of M. So if you're trying to distinguish uh, topological manifolds and you have two that carry hyperbolic structures, then suddenly all sorts of geometric invariants of these hyperbolic manifolds become topological invariants because if you had any other manifold, also hyperbolic, to which it was homotopy equivalent, it would have to have the same volume. It would have to have the same length of the shortest geodesics or the lengths of all geodesics which form an infinite sequence or invariants of them, etc. M has a unique geometry. Amazing. Okay, now this is a, see if Sorry, uh, listening. There's there's a mistake in the statement of this result. Do you, do you require that M one and M two are the same dimension? Um, that actually follows. Good question, though. So you wrote what of geodesic invariance of M in the last line? What is the word? Uh, sorry, links. Oh, thanks. Just a list of links. Okay, so what is the mistake in the statement of this result? There may be more than one. The dimension should be at least three. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So what is a one-dimensional hyperbolic manifold? Well, the hyperbolic line is just like the real line. It's all one-dimensional, simply connected manifolds are the same. And uh, so the quotient of the real line by an isometry is just a circle of some length. And the length of the circle is not, can be whatever you want it to be. So one-dimensional hyperbolic manifolds are just circles of different lengths, obviously, it's not a very deep theory, but they don't have to be isometric. For two-dimensional hyperbolic manifolds, it's actually quite interesting. There's, there's uh, almost all two-dimensional manifolds admit a hyperbolic structure. Um, in fact, every surface of genus two or more can be given a metric of constant negative curvature. And by the way, this is not a deep result. It's quite easy to construct a hyperbolic metric on a surface of arbitrary genus. It doesn't require the uniformization theorem. It's a simple something that Euclid could have proved. Um, but there's, in fact, there's many ways to build a surface of genus two out of hyperbolic polygons. So this theorem turns out to be false. And the way it's false is very interesting. Teichmuller theory parameterizes the different hyperbolic structures on a, a surface of a given genus. So, but the thing to note in dimension two is that this theorem would have been very powerful if it were true, because almost all two manifolds are hyperbolic, and so then they would have all these great invariants. But unfortunately, the theorem is not true. So, so I should add in here, if n is greater than or equal to three, and this is true, uh, then um, any homotopy equivalence comes from an isometry. Let me also mention that since these manifolds have contractible universal covers, to give a homotopy equivalence between M1 and M2 is the same as to give an isomorphism of their fundamental groups. So this theorem says that if the fundamental group of M determines the volume of M, which is a remarkable fact that this abstract, finitely generated group determines this rather exotic invariant. And the main case of interest is the case n is equal to three. 
And the reason this is this, this theorem is so important is that when n is equal to 3, work of Thurston and Perlman shows that most three manifolds are hyperbolic. For example, it used to be a quite difficult problem given two knots, say with 20 crossings, to determine whether or not these knots are the same knot. But it turns out that the complement of most knots is a hyperbolic manifold. And if you take two typical 20 uh, crossing knots, you can actually compute their hyperbolic structures um, in practice, compute their volumes. The volumes will almost never be the same. And this allows us to quickly distinguish knots that are different. If the volumes come out to be the same, there's even methods to keep working on the problem and often produce a proof that the two knot, uh, knot complements are the same. And so this is a very powerful result, and it underlies a big theme in mathematics at large uh, and a big theme of this course, which is rigidity. This hyperbolic structure is unique. It can't be deformed. It's rigid. Okay, so this is called uh, Moscow rigidity. And then for my, for my last example, I want to move to something um, that's more closely related to uh, maybe number theory. So um, this is called the Oppenheim conjecture. And, Sorry, uh, um, so yes. does, does Mustow rigidity not need compactness of the manifold? So um, it's false for manifolds with boundary. For example, if you were to take a surface uh, across an interval, it turns out the interior of this manifold carries many hyperbolic structures. Um, on the other hand, if you, if, in dimension three, if you allow manifolds whose boundary is a torus, boundary components are tori, it turns out that the interior carries a complete hyperbolic uh, uh, metric and uh, of finite volume. So the, the more um, natural statement or more complete statement of this theorem is that if this is a homotopy equivalence between hyperbolic manifolds of finite volume, then their fundamental groups determine the manifolds. Other questions? Okay, so, so let me talk about uh, this uh, as a third example, something about quadratic forms. Um, so the theory of quadratic forms um, classically has to do with things like sphere packings. You, um, you want to discuss the shapes of various lattices in uh, Euclidean space. Um, but where it becomes more dynamical is when you talk about not Euclidean space, but spaces uh, uh, with indefinite um, inner products on them. And similarly, when we want to discuss quadratic forms, their theory becomes very rich if we allow the quadratic forms to be indefinite. So I'll give you a special case of the Oppenheim conjecture. And, uh, and I'll say in words the more general case. So let's let Q of x, y, z be a quadratic form on R3. So in, uh, let me just make it um, x squared plus alpha y squared plus beta, uh, minus beta z squared, where uh, alpha and beta are um, positive real numbers. And now what we're interested in is the values of Q when restricted to integers. So if we set x, y, and z equal to integers, what numbers can we achieve? 
this is in the terminology of quadratic forms, one wants to know what real numbers are represented by this quadratic form Q. So we can just say, what does Q applied to Z3 look like? Okay, now, sometimes, um, and, and notice, by the way, that if I wanted to know whether or not Q hits a number in some interval from A to B, suppose I want to know if Q represents a point in this interval, well, it has infinitely many chances to hit a point in this interval, because I could take X and Y very large, and then I could take Z very large, and this term might nearly cancel these terms and give me a value that lies in this fixed bounded interval. So it's because the form is indefinite that this, the, the image of the integers is not discrete. If this were a definite form, it would certainly be discrete. The values would tend to infinity as the integers go to infinity in, in R3. However, even though it's indefinite, sometimes this, the image of the integers is discrete. What's an example? where it's discrete. If alpha and beta are integers. Louder? If alpha and beta are integers. Right, right. So if alpha and beta happen to be integers, then of course, this the values of Qs are integers. And more generally, if alpha and beta are rational numbers, then the values of Q are rational numbers with denominators controlled by the denominators of alpha and beta. E.g., when alpha and beta are in Q. So arithmetic gives rise to quadratic forms that have very constrained sets of uh, values. Um, but there's only countably many examples like that. Um, and using fairly simple methods, you will easily prove that if you choose alpha and beta at random, then the values of Q are dense. So certainly this phenomena is a measure zero phenomena. But in fact, and this is the remark truly remarkable fact, which is often a conjecture, is that the only way this set can be discrete is for alpha and beta to be rational. So the theorem, and this was proved by Margulis, is that um, if, well, let me put it this way, either alpha and beta are rational, or Q of Z3 is dense in R. And this is an extremely striking dichotomy. Uh, the reason is that um, we have um, an exact control over where the counterexamples come from. We, we understand what happens for every quadratic form. And actually, since I'm talking about ergodic theory, you might find that surprising. How, how is it that if you only are dealing with measure theory, you can say something about everything rather than everything up to measure zero? And this really requires, uh, is, is the harbinger of a, of a big advance in ergodic theory, which was put into its final form by Marina Ratner in the 1990s, uh, where one is able in certain special situations to analyze the behavior of every point rather than the behavior of almost every point. So the example, and, and the typical dichotomy looks exactly like this. There are examples where something's discrete, they come from number theory, and that's the only source of examples. Um, okay, so that's, that, let me put that up here. This is Oppenheim, and um, I want to draw your attention to another fact here, which is that if I had put, um, put something like this, minus beta z squared, uh, minus beta y squared, in other words, if I had gone to two variables rather than one, 
uh, this theorem would be false. There are irrational values of beta such that the values achieved by this indefinite quadratic form are still, um, well, they're bounded away from zero. So let's just say this is false for two variables. Just, in, just like Ross and rigidity was false for two variables, although it will turn out to be for a rather different reason. Okay, so now let me, let me um, back up and just throw out, probably I shouldn't have erased this, sorry. Let me back up a bit and, and state a theorem which is almost obvious and which is really fits into dynamics and number theory and is sort of the tip of the iceberg that expands and eventually includes these kinds of results. And this example is so basic that it almost seems trivial, and it, but in fact, it's very deep and it's, it's, there's many open questions still about this example. So one of my favorite examples in dynamics and ergodic theory is our space X is the unit circle, which I think of as R mod Z. T is a map from S1 to S1. It's just a rotation. So in other words, it's translation in the group law on S1. So we can write T of X is given by X plus alpha mod one, if you like. It's an irrational rotation of the circle. So you start with a point, you move it by alpha, etc. Now, of course, as in the case of quadratic forms, rationals give a fairly trivial example of this dynamical system. If you translate by a rational number with denominator Q and you start with zero, all the numbers you get have denominator Q. And there's only finitely many such numbers on the circle. So T has finite order. So the interesting case is where alpha is not rational, where it's an irrational number. And here, it's not hard to prove that the orbit of any point under the action of this mapping T is dense on the circle. Uh, but it's even better than that. So, um, so the theorem here, which I think is, goes back to Herman Weil, anyway, he gave a very nice proof of it, is that uh, the orbits of T are uniformly distributed. Now, what does that mean? Well, this allows me to introduce one of the main concerns uh, of ergodic theory and dynamics in general. Let's suppose we take a continuous function on the circle and a point on the circle, then we can start averaging the values of this uh, function along the orbit of T. So, um, so let me introduce some notation. In general, if we have a map from x to x, and then we have a continuous function f to the real line, so let's say x is a, is a topological space, maybe a compact metric space, and f is continuous. So I'll denote the space of continuous functions by c of x. Then we can form the sequence of numbers Sn of f, where we just take the values of f at uh, x. Um, I should write this more carefully as Sn of f of x. We take the values of f uh, at x, and then at the image of x under t, and then at the image under two iterates, of t all the way up to the nth point in the orbit. And then we divide by the number of points. And, um, and we ask whether or not these sums converge. And the answer in the case of an irrational rotation turns out to be they do converge. And they converge to what you would think they do, which should converge to, namely they give you the average value of f. So in other words, when you take the image of a single point under an irrational rotation, 
it spreads out evenly across the, the, um, the circle and so evenly uh, that, um, that, it, that the orbital averages compute the integrals of functions. So in other words, for all f, continuous functions on the circle, Sn of f of x tends to the integral over the circle of uh, f of x dx, by which I mean the integral with respect to the obvious probability measure, thinking of the circle as having a uh, total length one. And in fact, it does so very nicely. It does so even uniformly in x. Okay. So let me, that's my, my last example. I'm going to call that irrational rotation. Okay, so now I want to back up a bit and reveal to you some of the underlying structures behind these three examples. For example, where did Margulis get these expanding graphs from? It turns out that the theory of expanding graphs has to do with the Lie group SO3R. And so let me call that G. But not just this Lie group, it's also very important to consider the lattice SL3Z sitting inside of here. So you have a, a Lie group that is a manifold of the group structure, and you have a discrete subgroup. And SL3Z is, uh, which is just the matrices of a determinant one with integer entries, has the beautiful property that the volume of G mod gamma is finite. This is what we mean by saying that gamma is a lattice. And it turns out that these graphs are constructed by looking at the interplay between SL3R, SL3Z, and then there's a trick to get these finite graphs, SL3 of Z mod P. So there's an infinite sequence of finite groups associated to SL3Z, uh, and you use the Cayley graphs of these groups to generate your expanders, and then you use the representation theory of SL3 uh, the unitary representation theory to prove that this expansion exists. And the key uh, the feature here is that this group turns out to have what is called Kajdan's property T. So that's a concept that will develop as we uh, discuss ergodic theory and move towards this theory of expanders. Now, what about Mosdow rigidity? Well, you'll remember that my manifold was supposed to be a quotient of hyperbolic space by uh, uh, a discrete group. So I was interested in this manifold M, uh, which is a quotient of, let's say, Hn by gamma. But Hn can be thought of as a quotient of the automorphism group of Hn, or I guess I should say the isometry group of hyperbolic space uh, by this group gamma. And so again, we have a Lie group G, um, but the isometry group of Hn acts on gamma transitively, but it has a non-trivial stabilizer. There's a compact group, which is the stabilizer of a point in Hn. Um, and so the study of Mostar rigidity actually amounts to the study, again, of a Lie group and a lattice. And then also there's there's a discrete sub, there's a, a compact group in play here. And in some sense, the study of quotients of this kind, G mod gamma mod K, this is the, what one might call geometry. It's not arbitrary Riemannian geometry, it's the geometry of homogeneous spaces. And in this case, the geometry of uh, symmetric spaces. But the, point I want to illuminate right now is that there's a Lie group and a discrete subgroup and, a, and in this case another subgroup available and it's the interplay of these three things that will lead to the proof of Mosdow rigidity. Now what about the Oppenheim conjecture? 
For the Oppenheim conjecture, we're considering quadratic forms. Well, we might look at the set of all quadratic forms. Um, and, but a quadratic form, you can always rescale. It's not going to change the values of Q1, Z3, except by a scale factor. So you can assume that these quadratic forms have determinant one. And then the space of all quadratic forms of a given signature, the one I wrote down had signature two, one, two positive directions and one negative direction, can be thought of like this. Again, the group SL3R intervenes. It acts transitively on the space of, uh, of quadratic forms. The stabilizer of a given quadratic form is now a non-compact subgroup. It's the group H, which is SO21. That just means the orthogonal group for the standard quadratic form, x squared plus y squared minus c squared. And then we're interested in the value of the integers. So if we change, make a change of coordinates that sends the integer lattice to itself, it doesn't change the values of Q on the integers. So we might as well mod out by SO3Z. And it's the study of this space that leads to the proof of the Oppenheim conjecture. Now I should say this is a little bit of a lie because this space is totally wild. Whereas the quotient here is a manifold, the quotient here is not even Hausdorff. And it's not Hausdorff because this group H is not compact. H has lots of dense orbits on this space. And nevertheless, one is able to do ergodic theory and dynamics in this space. And in fact, the fact that this space is so small, the fact that H has such large orbits or so many orbits, such, such rich orbits, uh, is what underlies uh, the proof of Oppenheim conjecture. Okay, now finally, I want to come back to my baby example, the irrational rotation. Does the irrational rotation fit into this paradigm? It does because we can think of the circle as being G mod gamma, where G is R and gamma is Z. And then our transformation T is given by the action of another group, another copy of Z acting on R mod Z, but it's not just the standard Z, it's Z alpha. So in some sense, the study of an irrational rotation is the study of the quotient G mod gamma mod this second discrete group here acting on the left. So this series of pictures is really the setting for this course. Uh, almost all of the, the, uh, the deeper results will develop will sit inside of the world of uh, symmetric spaces and Lie groups. Um, although we will develop some very general results. Okay, so any questions on this little survey of ergodic theory and some examples that will flow from it? Now you might think this being the first day, I was gonna let you out 10 minutes early. To the contrary, um, if there's anyone left, I'm about to pose a problem and ask you to go to breakout rooms and solve it. So what I'd like you to do when we go to breakout rooms is first, just introduce yourself to the other people that you happen to be um, uh, uh, sent in with. Then I want you to choose a reporter the reporter should be the person who got up earliest this morning. And then I want you as a group to try to come up with an answer to the following question. And then when we come back from breakout room, the, in uh, let's say 10 minutes, the uh, reporters will announce their thoughts on this question. Okay, well, I gave you a preview of the question in my email. Namely, I asked you to look at the first few problems in the notes. And the question I'm going to pose is the first problem in the notes. And so the, the question is, how often does 2 to the n, when represented in base 10, start with a digit 1? 
me see if I can remember some powers of 2. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. Okay, so here, here's a 1, here's a 1, here's a 1, here's a 1. We only did, let's see, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 1, 2, 3. We only did 11 numbers, and we got 4 that came up 1. It looks like 1 occurs more often than other digits. Okay. So um, let me stop this share. And, um, and I'll ask you to reconvene in 10 minutes to tell me uh, your thoughts, and that'll, that'll be the end of the day. Okay, so let me see. Um, okay. So please uh, jump into the breakout room you've been assigned to. Kurt, should I like try to hop around the breakout rooms? Um, I think not. Not for right now. Okay. Um. Yeah. How did that work, uh, Carl? Oh, he left. <laughs> um. Hi, Benji. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you for letting me audit. Um, I must have seen that that um, that sign pointing to the lift line when I spoke to you before. Commented on it before. <laughs> so where again are you calling from? Uh, New York. <laughs> Although I might be traveling with my family um, to Israel soon um, to visit my grandparents. Wow, <laughs> that's that's big. Do, do you have to? Um, uh, quarantine when you arrive? So right now I would, although they claim that they have a four hour rapid test in the market very, that would um, mean I could probably just stay at the airport for four hours instead of quarantine. Really? And so you only have to pass one test? That's what they're saying. I'm not entirely sure though. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I want that. Uh, that's probably an antibody test. I'm guessing. Do you, do you know? I'm not sure. I don't think it's out yet. Although I think it's in like the final final testing. Mm. Nice. So, any suggestions for for class by Zoom? I'm. This is totally new to me. Oh, um, I think the blackboard was amazing, and you got a nice wide angle on it, which was super helpful. Oh, good. Okay. Um, have you taken a course using iPads or something like that? I haven't used them myself. One of my professors last, or Mike Hopkins used an iPad for his lectures, um, and he was very, very good at it. Um, but I, I've never used one myself. Okay, so it, it is also successful pretty much with an iPad. Yeah, definitely. I think what one reason I wanted to try the Blackboard, and I don't know if this was really effective, was um, you can see the person talking and the text at the same time. I mean, I guess you can sort of see that, but you sort of see them looking over their iPad or something. Yeah. Um, and I also, I mean, especially when introducing topics, I'd like to be able to gesture about them and point to things, and that's just a little more awkward or a little more yeah. passive, I think, with an iPad. The other thing is sometimes if you have all this stuff pre-written on the iPad, um, the time it takes to write it is like the time it takes to understand it too. So it's kind of easy for to write big formulas and rush through them when they're pre-written. Oh, so Mike would write things in advance on the iPad. Um, he didn't, but one of my other professors did. Um, and there were lots of times where he had to manually slow down the course. <laughs> right. Right. There's something called, um, uh, what is it called? It's, it's some sort of whiteboard space that I think Microsoft uh, Office developed, 
where you have an infinite whiteboard mm -hmm. and everybody is viewing it, but you can, you, in your personal view, you can move and see any part of it. Oh, well, that's cool. So, uh, you know, what I, what I discovered in the, the lectures I was going to, which were often given by keynote, is, you know, you get to slide five and you'd wish that you, they, you could go back to slide one. And so we started making the speakers post their slides. And then instead of actually looking at their slides, you look at the posted slides. And you could not only could you look back, but if you were getting bored, you could browse ahead. <laughs> Uh, good, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was kind of that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I see they let you into the um, science center. That's good that it's open up. So it's um, I, I I was chairman for the last three years. I just finished this summer, and I worked very hard to argue that mathematics should be treated on the same um, level or plane as, a, as the lab sciences. And that we needed access to our offices just as much as the chemists needed office access to their labs. Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, for people who had family or kids at home or, or that. And also, especially I think for graduate students and postdocs who might be sharing apartments and so on. Um, and so I, I was able to get it, them to allow us to, in fact, everyone in the math department back to the science center, but with these very stringent protocols. So when I go come into the science center, I feel like I'm going into a hospital, except there's no one else in the hospital. Wow. So it's everything is locked down, all the furniture is wrapped up, there's no common areas that you could use. I never see anyone walking around. Um, <laughs> and I think we made it so hard. You have to pre-register and you have to take a, a COVID test every week and so on. We made it, the hurdle so high. They were like, you can't let a hundred people back into the science center. I said, I'm not sure we're going to have a hundred. And we have like five people coming every week. <laughs> but then I worked very hard to get this, um, this, uh, video equipment going. And so I took over room 530. And eventually I got them to lend me a webcam, which I'm using today. I brought in an iMac. Um, I have a second monitor that I'm gonna to try to set up so I can see the gallery view better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, anyway. That's great. So what are you gonna do dur during your time off? Yeah, so I'm basically gonna continue the research that I've been doing this summer um, with Tristan Collins at MIT. Oh yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So. Um, needless to say, half a summer was not anywhere close to enough. So there's definitely a lot more work um, to do there, uh, which I'm really excited about. And it's been a really great experience. Um, I think I need to bring people back. Mm -hmm. um, I've never done breakout rooms before. I hope when I say close all rooms that they come back to the main room. <laughs> I think it'll close it for them, actually, and they'll all just be teleported. They'll be teleported. Okay, that would be good. Um, okay, I gave them 15 seconds. Do you know what the answer to this is, by the way? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, good. Well, I kept you from thinking for 10 minutes. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, I didn't realize I get, you get 60 seconds warning, not um, 15. I'll wait for people to come back. Excuse me if we go one minute over. Okay, so raise your hand if you're a reporter. And not that way. <laughs> okay, uh, Mary, go. Um, yeah, so we got that it was, uh, you know, log base 10 of 2% of the time, um, rough. And, and so that's like roughly 30%. And we 
I mean, if the number, if two to the n begins with the first digit one, then that means that, um, uh, you know, it's like between k times 10 to the p and k plus one times 10 to the p or something. And so then by taking logs, um, you get that the condition that, you know, on the, on the, if you think about everything mod one, the condition that it's has um, first digit one is just the condition that it's in the interval between zero and log base 10 of two. Okay, and good. So then uniformly distribution gives you the answer. Great. Uh, Rohil. Um, yeah. Was that right? Uh, it's a short I, I guess. So Rohil. But, Rohil. Yeah. yeah, so um, yeah, we, uh, we, we did the, we had pretty much the same approach, the, whatever this, oh, you can, you can write, write this thing down as, uh, I guess the dynamical system where you take the fractional part of K times log 10 of two, that determine that, or, uh, that determines the uh, first digit. I, I'm not explaining this very clearly, but. No, no, that, you, <laughs> that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And so what <laughs> result did you use then to complete the proof? Um, the fact that the uh, the torus or the circle rotation is ergodic. Well, we even had a bit more. of a even more. Well, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, uniquely ergodic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but this this sum here converging. Um, uh, Yan Sheng Yang. Yep. Hi. Hi. Um, so for us, we we got essentially the same thing, but we also noted that there's a and in this case, there happens to be an elementary solution, which is uh, you notice that uh, in every interval from 10 to the n to 10 to the n plus 1, there's always precisely one power of 2 with starting with digit 1. Oh, OK. Yeah. And so now the question is how many powers of two are there on average between 10 to the n and 10 to the n plus one, and that's log 10 over log two. So the proportion is log two over log 10. That's beautiful. Thank you for uh, uh, sharing that. Uh, Karina? I am Karina. Um, yeah, our group basically used similar approach, saying that um, sort of there's a correspondence between the occurrence of one at the beginning and um, the growth of decimal places. So we also got the frequency of log base 10 to, which is like 30.1-ish percent. Okay, let me, let me point out a, a little issue with regards to applying this theorem to, uh, to this problem which is that what we were trying to do was count the number of times an orbit passes through an interval. The interval goes from zero to log base 10 of two. And we're looking at how often this orbit visits this interval. Um, but this theorem is about, sorry, I'm not, I didn't turn on my screen. <laughs> But this theorem is about continuous functions. And the indicator function of an interval is not a continuous function. So I'll just leave that as a little nuance for um, how you would actually use this theorem to, to, to prove this theorem. For example, if I had replaced f here with a measurable function, say a bounded measurable function, this theorem would not be true. It's there, you might have an X whose orbit never enters that interval at all, that uh, measurable set at all. That's only a countable set, just throw it out. So the fact that there's some sets which work and some sets which don't is slightly uh, subtle here. Not very deep, but uh, just I wanted to raise that issue. Okay, so next I, I encourage you to take a Quick look at Bedford's law, which is linked on the um, on the web page for the course. And please remember to just uh, just say hi on the Slack channel and make some uh, comment. And I will see you on Tuesday. And you may see Carl on Friday or Monday. Okay, thanks for coming. And I will leave the room open if anyone wants to hang out a bit.
I, um, Professor, I have a question about my registration, but yes. I don't know whether I should just send you an email. I would, if I were in class, I would just ask you after class, but. Sure, go ahead. Anyways, it just sees that it's still not approved for me um, on the MIT page. So I was wondering if I should call the registrar or if you hadn't. Um, hang on. Uh, so I'm, I, um, I'm pretty sure that you are. So I, I, I certainly approved your petition. Let me just double check. So uh, according to Harvard, it says you are enrolled for a letter grade via MIT cross-registration. Oh, weird. Okay. I guess there must be some problem on the MIT side then. So maybe I'll just uh, try and call the registrar, but thank you. Yeah, I, you might just wait. <laughs> okay. A lot of problems these days go away if you wait long enough. <laughs> uh, right. I don't think it'll be a big deal. Okay. Awesome. Um, Thanks. Professor, uh, I'm also from MIT. I think I'm going to like submit an airdrop form and like you should get it soon. Um, okay. Yeah, I've been doing it in the class. It's great. Yeah, you wrote to me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wrote to me yesterday. Thank okay, you. that sounds great. I will get as I will sign your petition as soon as I get it. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Sure. Uh -huh. See you. Bye. Hi, gang. Hello. <laughs> uh, any any comments, advice, thoughts? The, the, the board was very clear. It was like a real class. Good. And I like it better in this way. Oh, good. Uh, can, can I ask a question about that second group? Maybe if, well, let me uh, just see if Carl has any logistical issues to raise with me. Um, I think no, things went pretty smoothly. Um, the students were using uh, the chat to actually answer and ask, answer oh, wow. uh, questions of each other a little bit during the course. Um, I, I think because they well, can't see the, the chat, chat anymore, is empty so. now. Yeah, it's. So I see somebody ask what the actual time was for the class, but I don't see anybody answering that. Oh, shoot. I think I missed that one. Okay. Okay. No big deal. Um, good. Yeah, I'm glad people started to discuss. It's funny, um, of, the, of the class of the people who became, um, who were the reporters, I think Rohil is actually at Princeton. And, oh. uh, he was the reporter of our group. Yeah, did you tell him that he's not allowed to be in the breakout room because he's not enrolled in the course? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I'll be a little easygoing about that. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a graduate student. So. Mm -hmm. um, did you happen to look, Carl, at who's uh, said yes to homework? Uh, I, I didn't record the list. Uh, oh, well, actually the, um, I should probably just stop this recording now. Oh, okay. <laughs>